Hello and welcome to The Gaggle, where we challenge and, if necessary, destroy media narratives. I'm George Samuori. With me today, of course, is co-founder of The Gaggle, Peter Lavelle. And we are once again uh, joined by uh, a guest who's appeared on our show before, um, uh, you know, uh, Gonzalo Lira, who is, of course, uh, a filmmaker, a writer, a journalist, and he's living in um, Ukraine. So he's right in the, um, the front line, or at least close to the front line. And um, since you were last with us, which was, I think, I guess, maybe a couple of months ago, um, there have been obviously um, several military developments. Um, the, uh, the Lugansk has been um, completely liberated. And now the fight is on uh, for uh, the Donetsk. And, um, but as far as the, much of the Western media coverage is concerned, we still keep reading about how badly the war is going for Russia. And we keep saying oh, yeah, that yeah. Russia is losing, you know, losing men hand over fist. It's losing uh, hardware. Well, uh, uh, well it, it, and, and you know, Peter, Peter can, can attest to the fact that Zelensky was riding a Ukrainian tank on the outskirts of Moscow, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's absurd, you know, it's, 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 look, it, it's 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 funny if it weren't tragic because the tragedy, of course, is that you have hundreds of uh, Ukrainian soldiers who are being killed needlessly, and and that is the tragedy. This, this is a day. war crime, and that's every, every day. Every day, yes, between five hundred and a thousand Ukrainian uh, armed forces soldiers are being killed at the front every day. They are outmatched. Yeah. I mean, like, look, you know, you, you can be, for instance, you know, uh, Peter, you're a tennis player, maybe. And, you know, you're a decent tennis player. If you go up in front of Roger Federer, I'm sorry, you're going to lose. I, I don't, no disrespect to you, but it's just the reality. It's, you have to know when you are outclassed. There are things that I'm very good at, but, you know, against somebody who's just better than I am, I just have to admit, yes, this guy is outclassing me and that's life. Uh, you know, and nobody's questioning the heroism or bravery of these uh, Ukrainian soldiers. What I am questioning at this point is the the sanity and, quite frankly, the the morality of the Zelensky regime. Because to throw away lives like this pointlessly it serves no purpose. It is only destroying Ukraine. That's it, it's so obvious that if you're paying attention, and one of the the, the well, the conclusion that I have come to is that Zelensky and his crew, they want as much money they can pump out of the West as they possibly be can, can before they have to make some kind of decision. Or when Zelensky um, imitating the um, Afghan president just airlifts the money out with them and he goes to some third destination. I'm, I'm yeah. sorry to be so cynical, but I can't see any other way around it. And plus, I'm sure you've, you've been coming across these stories how um, mayors, all across Ukraine are saying, look, I mean, everything goes to Kiev and then we get, if we get anything, it's crumbs, okay? I yeah. mean, where's all this going, okay? Yeah. I mean, they, they, they're, it's and being they, stolen. It's being stolen. Well, of course, of course, that's George and I said that on day one, okay? Yeah. Um, yeah. And because the, the day before, that was a talking point. Ukraine is a corrupt place. And now that talking <laughs> point has disappeared. Or yeah. it's, it's, it's on the margins now. It's beginning because there is fatigue here. I mean, certain the Russians need it yet? I mean, what's going on? Yeah. No, well, it's, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, George. Go ahead. Oh, Go I was on. just going to say, I think the fatigue is emerging, which is that while they keep repeating, oh, Russia's doing badly, Russia's doing badly, they're not able to go with the corollary, which is what well, Ukraine is doing well. Because if you ask what well, Ukraine is doing well, well, what has it done well? What what territory has it recaptured? What offensives has it mounted? Where where has it won anything? Um, they keep still talking about this Kiev, this this fictional battle of Kiev. Oh yeah, the that never fiction, happened. But completely it's fictional. Out, you know, yeah. It's still somehow in the future. Yeah, there's going to be an offensive in Kherson any moment now. Um, yeah. But that, I think that's the problem. They're not able to come to biden or blinken and say well here you know we've, we've achieved this this and this because they haven't achieved anything well the thing is see the uh, the american administration knows that they haven't achieved anything and they're not stupid or not that stupid at any rate uh the pentagon certainly knows exactly the score and so everybody in washington and within the beltway knows that ukraine has been losing from the get-go that there was no battle in kiev that this offensive in kherson is imaginary you know, uh, but they have decided, and this seems to be the trade, and you two tell me if you think I'm wrong or, or more or less right. It seems that the trade is Washington will keep feeding Zelensky money so long as Zelensky keeps pushing soldiers 
in front of Russian artillery. And that seems to be the play here. And in Washington, they're perfectly aware that the weapons and the money that they're sending to Ukraine is being siphoned off, embezzled, stolen. They know this, and they are doing it deliberately because what they really want is to just keep on throwing bodies at uh, the Russian army because they have this absurd notion that by throwing Ukraine bodies at Russia, Russia will somehow get weakened. They don't seem to understand even modern warfare. They don't understand certainly industrial warfare, the kind of industrial warfare that's, that's taking place right now in Ukraine, where it is estimated conservatively that for every um, one Russian casualty, Ukraine is suffering seven. Mm. And, and these are people who are not pro-Russian. These are Western observers. And that seems to be the, the, um, the ratio at this point. The BBC um, uh, last month, last at the end of uh, July, did a survey uh, throughout Russia of all Russia social media trying to count up how many dead soldiers. Because you, you see, you can't hide dead bodies, of course. You know, you, what happens is that they get buried. And, and a burial of a soldier, there's an announcement and the whole, the whole shebang. And the BBC was only able to count 5,000 uh, Russian dead. And th they were disappointed. They were like, where are all the others, you know, the great victory? And no, whereas it's, it's conservatively estimated at this point that Ukraine has lost uh, as many as potentially 50,000 men dead. And insofar as uh, wounded, captured, deserted, it's probably twice that number. So we're going into an army that went in, a fighting army that went in with 230,000 men. And right now, Conservatively, it's estimated that they are down to about eighty thousand. You know, if you consider the, um, the the losses from killed in action and the uh, captured, missing in action, and deserters, you know, and 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 wounded, of course, you know, so it, it, it's a disaster. They should end this. This is inhumane at this point. The only they, bright spot is that you know now the Battle of the Donbass is about to end. The Russians are about to break through, and they're going to overrun Kramatorsk. And once that happens, once it's clear that the Do Battle of the Donbass is over, then it could be a come to Jesus moment where the, the Ukraine people and the, whatever is left of sanity in the Kiev regime says, you know, enough. And they try to shut it all down finally. But well, we'll have we to have wait and see. We have to point out, um, it's very important for our viewers to understand, is that um, this it was an army that was trained, moneyed, um, leadership, logistics, the works of her eight years, okay? And, yeah. and we, and um, George and I always use shortcut and we shouldn't, none of us should. This war has been going on for eight years, okay? Yeah. And so yeah. um, I think it was um, Scott Ritter, uh, right? Um, George said, he said, you know, this was the, a very powerful army if you compare them to NATO armies. Of course, the US has the largest military establishment in the world. If we, if we look at NATO, Turkey comes in second place. And then the de facto member of, of, uh, of NATO was Ukraine, okay? Yeah. Well, I mean, and people don't like to mention this is that, I mean, it was the best force they could muster. It was a lot of money poured into it, a lot of help, a lot of um, assistance. Who we? I have to absolutely believe that there are Americans and British on the ground um, helping them use these this military hardware. Uh, absolutely, um, no question. And so, yeah. and so you know, um, you know, so you know, you know, it's a Goli David and Goliath. Well, maybe it's so, but Ukraine was was given a lot of uh, uh, backing uh, in every sense of pos possible way. So this is a real military conflict. Right. Well, that, that brings up an, an interesting uh, question. I mean, so maybe it's a slightly side issue, but um, Stoltenberg uh, the other day was in Norway, gave one of his. Uh, he was at I his, hate him. Yeah, they all do. Yeah, <laughs> he's an idiot. Yeah, that, that, that man is has negative camp. IQ points as far yeah. as I'm concerned. But no, yeah, he, I'm sorry, George. Yeah, no, no, he was at this um, the summer camp, that same summer camp when Anders Breivik um, murdered all those. Oh people yeah, yeah, yeah. In yeah, 2011. Yeah. So he, he was addressing this uh, the summer camp. And uh, and he was saying that well you know we you know we're doing what we can for Ukraine you know self defense and, and and so on and said so but NATO is not a party to the conflict and um, and and he was sort of puzzling because he, then he said what did he mean by NATO is not a party to the conflict we don't have any troops there so that's his kind of definition well we don't have any troops now in the first place I I don't know whether they have troops there or not I mean that's just his claim 
But even if you don't actually have direct uh, men in combat, um, you are still a party to the conflict. I mean, the ah. United States had advisors and trainers in South Vietnam for a decade, at least yeah. a decade before you know the the the, the men with the uh, you know with in combat started arriving. Yeah, but that was that's still American troops. I mean, there were thousands yeah. of uh, advisors and trainers in South Vietnam. I mean, his ridiculous kind of hair splitting saying, well, yeah. we're not a party to the conflict but we don't, because the, the 82nd Airborne Division isn't actually fighting in Ukraine. I mean, it just shows the delusional nature of, uh, of NATO in general. Well, it, it's, it's the lying that I find just, you know, despicable. But, well, look, at the end of the day, what, what's very obvious retrospectively, because we're, we're coming in on, you know, what, what is it now? It's going to be six months. It's five and a half months since this conflict started. And what's, what's very, very clear is that uh, NATO got spooked. The Pentagon got spooked early on. And uh, it seems retrospectively that you all recall that, that strike on, uh, on that training center in uh, uh, Yavodiv, uh, just uh, west of Lviv, just about 20 miles from the border with um, Poland, right? That was a staging area. That was, in fact, a training area where NATO would send troops. It was the international security, peacekeeping, blah, blah, blah. I forget the name of it, but everybody calls it Yavodiv. Um, and there, you know, the Russians early in March, I do believe like around, I want to say that like the 7th or March or something like that, they sent this missile strike and uh, annihilated over 400 uh, troops that were all for it. They were contractors, volunteers, and among them were NATO personnel who were going to be laying the groundwork for more NATO to enter the conflict. And the Russians, uh, you know, just blew them away with a missile strike in the middle of the night. They also destroyed, the Russians destroyed some $400 million worth of gear in the one go, the one go. And um, the thing that I have heard from multiple sources is that the Pentagon got completely freaked out by this attack for two reasons. Number one, they didn't see these missiles coming. And that was a thing that totally spooked them. They were hit, hit really hard. It was a swarm of missiles, like about a dozen. They were hit and they didn't see them coming until you know 15 seconds before the, the arrival. I mean, no chance to react, no chance to do anything. And their air defenses were completely useless against this missile strike. Not one of the missile defense uh, that, that was in place at that time could stop these missiles and they were hypersonics. It was the one time that they've been used in this, in this conflict so far. And it was clearly a message. And the message was, if NATO steps in, we're gonna really fry your butt, okay? And th that, that seems to me the reason that the Pentagon has been so leery of actually putting troops on the ground because they know that they can't take the Russians. Because also there's something else that from the very start of this conflict, everybody's been saying, why aren't the Russians using their top tier gear, their best missiles, their best tanks, their best air defense systems? They're using the second tier equipment, which is very good, more than enough to deal with uh, the Ukraine armed forces, but not their top tier stuff. Why? It's very obvious because they were saving it in case that they needed to use it for NATO and they didn't want yeah, to yeah. use them and have NATO study them and be able to get good intelligence to counteract them. And so all of the, the one time that they used their top tier gear was in, in that strike in early March. And that's when NATO, that's when the Pentagon said, no, 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 we want no part of this. That retrospectively seems to be what uh, has happened. I mean, we will never know until we actually see the documentation of the decision-making process. And that'll be years, if not decades. But my thinking at this point that the only uh, American NATO troops who are on the ground are certainly, you know, CIA critters, intelligence types of all stripes, right? And the other is probably the operators of some of the equipment like the M777 howitzers and the HIMARS in particular, because those systems, uh, it's not something that you just give it to, give it, give it to somebody and here, here are the keys, go and use it. No, you, you got to train and it takes a long time. It takes months, in some cases, years. There's a lot of, there's a lot of support material to go that along too, with it. That too, that too. And so, so the notion that they just handed the, the, this equipment and, and you figure it out and here's the training manual, come on. They obviously have American operators for some of this gear if not all of it, but at least a good portion of it. Right. And so, yeah, th there are NATO and American troops on the ground. 
But I think it, it's so reduced that everybody's pretending that they're not there, but they are there. But they're not in a quantity enough that the Russians would say, okay, we're in an open war with NATO. You, you see what I mean? And if these men get killed, NATO is not going to go to war with Russia. You know, it, it's, it's political impossibility. But that there are NATO troops, yes, but uh, a minimal. I, I, I mean, I would surprise, I'd be very surprised if you told me that it was over 500 in, in Ukraine. I mean, do keep in mind the number of troops that we're talking about here. The Russian forces are numbering, right now it's estimated that they have about 150,000. Okay, so 500, um, uh, 150,000 on the ground in Ukraine fighting. So 500 is just a speck of dust in the, in the whole scheme of things, right? But, um, but yeah, I think that, thank God that NATO is not getting involved in this war. But now, now China, oh yeah, let, let's, let's start a war with China because you know, it worked out so well for poor Ukraine. But, but this let's is have kind of Taiwan good. and throw Taiwan to the lions, you know? But this, but this again goes, goes to uh, the point that NATO you know, it, it's been doing this uh, very, very sophistical arguments, this hair splitting. So one part of it is this, well, we, haven't tro- we don't have troops on the ground. We're not a party to the conflict. If, however, Russia um, extends this, if decides, hey, we need to hit a target in Poland because Poland is providing so much support for uh, Ukraine, then that's mm-hmm. unprovoked aggression against NATO. That's the line sure. that they're going to come up with, just like sure. this w- attack by Russia was an unprovoked aggression. So therefore, if you attack Poland, that's unprovoked aggression, and Article 5 goes into operation one for all and all for one. Um, but-, but I don't think that's going to happen. I, I, I think, think it's so over. Now, I, don't, I don't know, guys. I don't know, guys. I, I I think seriously. I think Russia wants to break the back of NATO once and oh yeah. And oh, I yeah. think, and I think, <laughs> definitely. I, you know, I I'm, I don't want it to happen, but I could see a scenario. George and I've talked about this uh, at great length. Is um, I mean, you know, that you have the the favorite villain in Europe, uh, Orban. I mean. So here you have, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of military hardware with, with um, uh, foreign advisors, primarily American and British, on the just right over the Polish border, and the and the Russians attack it. Is that unprovoked? No. Who's provoking whom? And I, I personally think is that we could get into a scenario and say, you know, you know, well, I'm going to call your bluff, okay? Because Article Five is. It's not automatic. It's like everybody gets together, no. you have kind of no. a chat. What do we do here? I mean, this is so mythologized. It's ridiculous. Okay. Right. Yeah. And then and, and talking about unprovoked. Well, if you have all that military hardware and troops and advisors on the po- on the Polish border with Ukraine, does Article One apply? Well, exactly. I mean, that, Article that, One is, that's is in violation. That's right. Article one, which says that all NATO member states are obligated to resolve all conflicts by exclusively peaceful means. So Mm -hmm. therefore the only thing that, you know, when Article 5 can be invoked, if you are indeed the victim of an unprovoked attack, you haven't done anything at all to provoke this. I mean, given everything NATO has done, I mean, the last thing you call it is (laughs) unprovoked. Um, So I mean, what Peter's saying is it was very interesting. I mean, you know, at what point would the Russians say, we're fed up with this because it's ridiculous to pose well, the, the, the Russians... pretending to be a neutral and is not a, not a party to the conflict. And they're killing Russian troops with, with that material. They're yeah. killing Russian. Yeah. Right. yeah, 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 I know. But the, the thing is, I, I think that the Kremlin and, and, the, and Putin are very, very patient. And, and certainly there are people within the Kremlin who want to go to war. They want to go to war with NATO. I have no doubt that there are hawks within the Kremlin. But the, the people who are running things are very, very shrewd people. And so it, it's very clear that, uh, you know, Putin and the people who are supporting Putin, number one, they're succeeding. OK, so they have the political wind at their back. Uh, number two, they, they know they they know the limits of what they can do. They can go right up to the border. And I think that they will go right up to the border of Ukraine and Poland, but they're going to stop there. And they're not going to mind any kind of provocation uh, that comes from Poland or the Baltic states, so long as they don't cross the border. They don't cross the border into um, Ukraine. They don't cross the border into Belarus. Or in the case of Estonia, they don't cross the border into Russia. I think that, and, and Finland, of course, doesn't cross into Russia. I think that they've made up their minds that, you know, we're, we're going to play this, you know, close to the vest, but we're not going to do anything stupid. We're going to be patient. And that strategy of patience has proved remarkably effective. Okay, well, let me, let me throw this at you. 
Sure. I'm sure you came across as I thought. Uh, George, I, I want everybody to know, well, everyone that watches the gaggle knows, um, I lived in Poland for 10 years, okay? Uh -huh. And um, I'm always finding these stories. Uh, there's no, you know, the leader leadership in Kiev, leadership in more. There's no border that separates us. We're brothers in arms and all. Um, unfortunately, we have some bad historical experiences. Yeah, bad. That's an understatement. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's kind, of an, it's, it's kind of a back door, isn't it? Where the, 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 they're, they're trying to dissolve. They're invited uh, in. Yeah. Um, carrying guns, maybe. I can, <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's a very weird, ambiguous thing here. And of course, being a historian, um, the Poles, well, there are people that still covet those lands because it was oh, sure. Poland, okay? Sure. And so sure. it's kind of, kind of seamless, isn't it? I mean, it, 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 it achieves a number of- Yeah, what they're because, trying to do is erase the border between Ukraine and, and Poland, right? Uh, yeah, they can try. But see, when, when it comes to the issue of actual troops crossing the border, actual Polish troops crossing the border into Ukraine, they're going to get wiped out, of course, you know, and the Russians, the Russians have said so repeatedly, okay? And the thing is, see, that they've demonstrated by, by the events at uh, 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 Yavodiv, that they have the muscle to do it. They're, it's not just empty talk. And so I have no doubt in my mind that if the Poles were foolish enough to send troops their way, that'd be that. that. That would be the end of these poor bastards, okay? And the thing is, see, there, there's also a key issue that people aren't paying enough attention to, although some people have. There was a very celebrated article in the Royal Unified Services Institute um, website. Uh, RUSI is a think tank of the British military. It's basically the British equivalent of the RAND Corporation. And there was a very celebrated article called The Return of Industrial Warfare. And the author, whose name slips my mind right now, but you can look it up, um, at the Royal Unified Services Institute, he pointed out something that is kind of devastating. He pointed out that, see, um, everybody in the West had assumed that industrial warfare was a thing of the past, that it was now the new war, you know, insurgency and that sort of thing. And the thing is, see, this war is showing that, you know, artillery, the, uh, artillery is the god of war. King. And the thing is, he, he pointed out that uh, the West does not have the industrial capacity to go head to head with the Russians. They would run out of, the West would run out of ammunition within a couple of months. They would not be able to sustain uh, a, a long-term uh, industrial warfare against Russia. And Russia has endless capacity because they've specifically uh, um, built their um, military industrial complex to, to coin a term, they've specifically tasked it with having the wherewithal to keep on producing in the event of the war. During these five and a half months, the Russians are still producing artillery shells, still producing cal uh, caliber missiles, still producing all that good stuff. Three ships, round the clock. Right. They're not stopping, exactly. Yeah, it, well, yeah. You know, 24 seven, just producing and stamping out gear to go blow up somebody, okay? Right. Yeah, you kind of- The Americans, the yeah. do, you know, do you know the great problem of the Javelin missile, for instance? You know, the Javelins were made in the 90s, right? And they require a battery pack to be able to arm them, right? Well, the thing is, see, they've been in storage for so long that the battery packs didn't work and there were no replacements, you know? And they kept on talking about the, I forget, okay, look, I forget it was the Stinger missiles or the Javelin missiles, it's not important. It was one of these handheld missile systems that you just put on your shoulder and fire away. The batteries were dead and there was no way to revive them and no replacement because the West has forgotten about industrial warfare and the Russians never have. And so, you know, the, the, this article, which I suggest everybody read, is very, very interesting. The return of industrial warfare. And basically, you know, it's, it's, it's not gonna happen. The, it, the West very, cannot go toe to toe with the Russians. It, it's very interesting that you say that because I, I remember very clearly, because I was in the RT studio, um, endless hours covering uh, uh, the conflict in Georgia. And mm -hmm. I can remember um, the Western, um, you know, the armchair general saying, well, this is kind of typical Russian tactic, steamrolling, just overwhelming, swarming. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, because it works. Okay, yeah. it works. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, they, they just oh, it's very antiquated, and you know, they, it's not imaginative. Yeah. It didn't matter. The result was what they wanted. Okay. Yeah, it's exactly. Just to echo what you were saying there. Right. No, yeah, that, exactly. Yeah. You know, that, that, you know the, 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 they keep insisting on, like, for instance, Western technology. Right. It's so superior to the Russian technology. It probably is. But here's the the big problem. 
See this M777 howitzer that they kept talking about? It was the latest wonder weapon that would, you know, change the balance. It was a game changer. They've had so many game changers that I don't even know what sport we're playing anymore. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, these guys, they kept insisting that the M777 was a game changer until it actually was used in an actual war. And the Ukraine general, uh, not general, he was a ministry of defense, uh, assistant minister of defense, who was in charge of logistics. And he said that the problem with the M77s is that, you know, you use them in one go, you know, one six hour shift, and then you needed to replace parts. It was just inoperable. And the parts were not there or they were extremely delicate. And, you know, it was, a, it was basically, he was saying, you know, you could use it once and that was it. And then you had to just set it aside and send it to get repaired send it to Poland to get repaired. Whereas the Russians, you know, they, 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 their howitzers, you know, you kick them some and it starts working again, just shovel shells into it and keep on firing for crying out loud. I mean, there is something to be said about something simple, something simple, durable, robust. Yeah. The Americans, the West, you know, the God of technology has overwhelmed them. So all their technology is so sophisticated, but at the first brush with basic military gear and basic military um, strategies and tactics and operations, they, 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 they're inoperable, okay? I wanna know, you know, they have all these F-35 aircraft and F-22 aircraft that are so sophisticated. I wanna know how long those planes will last in actual combat because the Russian planes, man, I mean, really it's, it's like the AK-47, they all built them to be super redundant, super simple, that work, they're not the most sophisticated. They're not even close to being sophisticated, but they work. And, and the Americans, of course, in the West, well, they were suckered by weapons manufacturers who wanted just more money. Yeah. And so what they did was they, these guys said, these are super sophisticated and also super the weapons expensive. manufacturers, right. super expensive. And they were thinking also, all those spare parts that are necessary are just more moolah, more, more of the green stuff, you know? But, and yeah, so that, but that's, that approach, that's why they're not even been that successful, even in the the wars that the U.S. has waged against yeah. mediocre opponents. I mean, mediocre relative to the United States. I mean, we're talking about the war in Vietnam. I mean, essentially, America just had to say, we're not going to win this war. You know, we've got all this sophisticated technology. You know, yeah. they're just a bunch of, uh, you know, guys in pajamas uh, running around in the jungle, but we can't de defeat them. <laughs> and, then, and they did this, you know, they bombed and bombed Yugoslavia, and then finally they had to say, well, the only way we can win this is we just destroy everything, just, just level Belgrade, you know, and there'll be nothing <laughs> left. Uh, that, that's that because all the, all, the, all the sophisticated technology wasn't actually getting them any of the results they were seeking. I, 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 a few years ago, I went to um, uh, Kabul when uh, Karzai was still president. It was his, he was leaving power, and I went down with a, a Russian um, group of uh, journalists to interview him. And um, it was a really eye-opening experience. Number one, all of the architecture was Soviet in Kabul. I mean, <laughs> I, I felt like I was in the outskirts of Moscow. I mean, even the cement was the same, okay? And that dreary green paint, it was, you know, you know that color, okay? Yeah, yeah. It's all over this part of the world. Anyway, <laughs> you, you'd see the, the Afghan soldiers. What did they like? Uh, they liked the um, uh, army boots because they're you know, very nimble, very cool looking. They, they like the khaki uniforms, um, but they didn't like the gun. They had Kalashnikovs. So it really, for me, it was no. like, yeah, all of the um, um, trimmings of a military, you know, it, it looks cool, but that's not what wins battles, okay? Yeah. It's the hardware that win, yeah. wins battles. Yeah, what's shocking is that the United States has a military budget uh, last year, we just got approved something like $860 billion. And the Russians are making do with about, I do believe it was $65 billion. So it's less than a tenth. I mean, if my math is correct, it would be one fourteenth. You're talking about like roughly 7 8% of the American budget. And the Russians are proving themselves uh, more capable militarily. I mean, look, let's face facts. The, the Americans didn't want to go into Ukraine because they got a good look at the Russians and they're like, no part of this. And you have, it's not just the equipment, it's the soldiers. The, the, the Russian soldier uh, and the Ukraine soldier for that matter. I mean, they're, they're fighting on their home turf. This, this land is theirs, okay? Um, I, I'm, I'm not talking about, uh, uh, you know, Ukraine or Russia. I'm talking about this area. This is Eastern Europe. This is Ukraine, Russia. This has been their land for millennia. 
And, you know, some rando American soldier shows up here. He's going to get the ever living shit kicked out of him. I'm sorry for the language, but it's the truth. And, we, and he doesn't care. He doesn't care. And on top of that, you, you see that the Americans, because of the vaccine mandates and this whole woke culture thing, which is like a cancer of the mind, all the best soldiers have left the U.S. military. So, you know, you, you basically have a hollow army. It, 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 it's just a bunch of fools r- driving these very expensive military Ferraris, if you will, that are, you know, that break all the time, that are exceedingly expensive to maintain and don't do the job. You're going to lose. And I think that the, the Pentagon realizes this and that's why they want to know part of this war because they know they'll lose. But now the crazy neocons are turning to China. I heard the word about an hour ago before I, I, I came on that the uh, Chinese, that the Americans rather, they want to have military uh, ships sailing through the Strait of Taiwan while the uh, USS Ronald Reagan monitors the situation. I'm mean, like, it's bad enough that Pelosi went to Taiwan. Now they want to like poke the, the, the Chinese right in the eye. What the hell is the matter with these people? I mean, the, what drug are they taking? Please stop, okay? You know, just say no. That's, that's my, my, uh, my advice to these people because they're crazy. They're, they are deliberately trying to provoke a war with Russia, with uh, China rather. They tried with Russia, didn't succeed. So now they're stirring up trouble in Kosovo. Which again, you know, uh, let sleeping dogs lie. Oh no, no, no! We got to go and poke the dog and see if he bites. You know, I mean, yeah, they were doing some hinky stuff with Kaliningrad. These people don't know when to quit. That's the problem. They do not know when to quit. And the thing is, see, if they keep on going like this, the United States is going to suffer a loss that is going to be more, far more traumatic than Afghanistan. I mean, because either China or the Russians, probably the Chinese, they're going to say, oh, we're not going to put up with this. We're just not, our sense of dignity and our self-respect does not allow us to put up with this nonsense. And they're going to hit back at the Americans. And they have capacity now. Oh, yeah. Capacity. That's the point. And I'm, I'm really glad that you brought it up because George mentioned this on the, on the gaggle months ago, is that... Um, with a, um, a, an estimated 150,000 troops, you know, that that is, and, and Putin said, what was it, three or four weeks ago, I'm paraphrasing, we haven't seen anything yet, okay? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, so, um, yeah, I mean, th- th- there's real capacity here, and obviously, um, P- Pentagon planners were never, they, they haven't fought anything like this, what, since Vietnam, I mean. Well, it, it, earlier, it, yeah. This, this it, kind of war hasn't been seen by the Americans since Korea. Korea, no. More like Korea, yes, I, no. I agreed here. No. Um, and the Chinese, I mean, there are different estimates there, but I mean, George and I talked about this uh, on Wednesday. Um, I, I tend to think, um, and I did this on Crosstalk yesterday, and I had a Chinese guy on uh, from Beijing, one of their think tanks, and I, I think I started him. I said, look, one China policy, if, it's not, if both sides don't adhere to it, why should either side uh, uh, adhere to it, okay? I think that's part of China's response. It's not gonna be a bells and whistles, it's gonna be a concerted uh, um, campaign, step by step by step, until we get to the point where, okay, now it's your turn, guy, what are you gonna do about it, okay? I think that's what's in really play here. But, but the, the timing of it, I mean, that's what really I find really bizarre. You're in the dumps. I mean, uh, even the Washington Post and the New York Times are beginning to pull the curtain back. You know, the communication with, uh, Was- uh, uh, with Washington and Zelensky isn't as good. Um, yeah. uh, no, they're, they're, they're setting him up to dump him. Well, I, uh, <laughs> the problem is also with Zelensky, which is that he's kind of shooting his mouth off all the time, oh, God. which is um, uh, OK, so long as he's announcing he's an actor. the, the That's Russians. Why. But when one of his flunkies said, well, you know, um, whenever we target anything, um, we don't uh, we don't do it without the Americans signing off on it. <laughs> yeah, I know. So when yeah, they I say know. this, and they just made launched this attack against this prison, um, he's pretty much saying, "Hey, this was a war crime, and the Americans yeah. signed off on it." Now this yeah. is very problematic. I mean, it basically yeah, it's a disaster because it's the Americans PR. always say, "Hey, it wasn't us. We didn't commit a war crime. It was they. They did it. You know, that, nothing to do with us. We're not a party to this." But this Ukrainian saying, no, 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 you know, we don't target anything without uh, the Americans either telling us what to target or um, telling us what not to target. So they obviously yeah. signed off on this. So they, they basically they blurted out 
that America is responsible for a war crime. They're, this this kind of thing is the Americans don't like. That, that's, a, that's a very oh, yeah. dangerous admission. Um, and then you had this Amnesty International report yeah. the other day, which said... Yeah, know, basically saying that the Zelensky regime is... Yeah, so, yeah, well, what, what's happening, of course, is the following. See, in, in, if, you, if you think of it internally in Kiev, right, this attack on the, on the uh, prison of war camp, let's, let's talk about that in, in Donetsk, this Donetsk city. Uh, what happened, of course, was that this missile was fired from the Ukrainian side it, it, it clearly, by trajectory, everyone was like, yeah, it was, and, and the pieces of it that they found in situ were, you know, pieces of high mark, okay? Uh, so it was definitely the American uh, weapon system. That weapon system, it is believed, generally believed that it is operated by Americans. It's targeting information is most definitely provided by the Americans because the Americans don't want to give that technology to anybody in case uh, it slips into enemy hands. And so, the Americans knew exactly what was being hit, number one. Number two, the Ukraine, uh, the, the Zelensky regime and the Poroshenko regime before it were hitting Donetsk relentlessly for eight years of shelling. So they know that city down to the square centimeter. They know exactly what they're hitting at any given time. So it wasn't some stray missile, you know, some accident. It was very deliberate. Now, why did they hit it? Well, because, you know, you, you're starting to see a lot of testimony yeah. of Azov fighters with the Nazi tattoos and the whole shebang, right? They are testifying uh, and saying things that really incriminates the Zelensky regime, the Ukraine uh, leadership class generally, you know, I mean, all kinds of stuff about how Mariupol, the civilians were used as human shields and they were shot at, you know, all kinds of war crimes, right? And so they were like, we gotta shut them up. Let's just, you know, hit them with a missile and blame the Russians like they tried to do at Kramatorsk. Remember the Kramatorsk train station? I'll never forget that one. The only reason they, they stopped talking about it was that that Italian TV crew uh, stumbled on the piece of the missile and, and filmed the serial number. And it was right in the middle of the list of serial numbers that were known to belong to Ukraine or to the Zelensky regime. Uh, and so anyway, uh, you know, they tried, they deliberately targeted that POW camp. I mean, the, the um, Zelensky regime even told the Russians to move them to this prison. Uh, there was some reason for it. I forget exactly the, the details. It's so important. They knew exactly who they were hitting. They hit them deliberately. And now in Kiev, the problem is that the far right forces that are there, because as of as a, as a functioning unit, as a political unit is gone, but there are sympathizers, far right, crazy ass neo-Nazi sympathizers in Kiev that are saying, hey, you know, you killed our guys. They're saying to the Zelensky regime and his little circle. And so they, the, the Zelensky regime, they have to save their butts and they're blaming it on the Americans. And the Americans aren't liking this because it was obviously some de decision that was taken in concert between Zelensky and the Americans. Because of course, the testimony of these Azov prisoners of war would implicate uh, Zelensky just as much as it would implicate the minions in Washington. And so, you know, there is no honor among thieves, of course. You know, this is, you know, the, 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 the prisoner's dilemma. Zelensky immediately pointed the finger through his, um, through his subordinates, through his spokespeople, and said, oh, yeah, the, the Americans did the targeting. And now the Americans are like, dude, and you see what's going on. This, this is the, the situation. And it's a complicated story, but once you understand the individual moving parts, it's really easy to understand the motivation. Basically, they know that they're losing. And so they're starting to blame each other. I did a video that was very celebrated and they got a lot of views. And I speculated that the Americans might make up their minds that it's better off to have a dead Zelensky than a living Zelensky. And I, and I wouldn't put, put it past the Americans I, to do this. I, I mean, would, they, they killed, they killed the, the South Vietnam president back yeah, in 63. And go DM. Yeah. I, yeah. I would add to that is that, you know, um, just from what you've been saying here, um, Zelensky's um, uh, outside of the ridiculous media coverage, Vogue magazine and all that stuff, um, he's I losing believe friends. That. He's lo losing friends left and right. Okay. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. Um, um, I, and I've been, you know, asked, you know, uh, about Zelensky very often, and they, I said, well, you know, if he, he's actually a boon for the Russians, because the more he flaps his mouth, okay, 
the more he says things that embarrass him, his regime, and his um, um, uh, sponsors. I mean, yeah. they could have taken him out on day one, and they didn't. Yeah. And they won't. They won't. Okay. No, 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 they won't. I think and George and I have talked about this at great length. Is that they'll be they're going to blame the Russians? They, well, no, they're going to have a regime change. Of course, you can blame you know the, the heat on the Russians if you want. Oh no, 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 no. My, my my thinking is that what the what's going to happen is that the Americans are going to shoot a high Mars at at Zelensky and blame the Russians. That, that's my my suspicion. It's possible. It's possible. Yeah. Uh, because because the thing is, see, they built him up so much yep. that they can't now pull him down with the press. He he's been he's like the new Winston Churchill, you know, and and all of these people like Mon Mike Pompeo and all the people at State Department, all these people, all of the people of the blob, if you will, they built him up so much that they cannot now tear him down. They, and they, that's they, the uh, thing. Oh uh, yeah. The, but the, 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 the drawback to that, and that's I mean, it's an interesting uh, idea, is that if they, he's assassinated, um, and he's a saint. He's a saint. He's a saint. He's a and they immediately yeah. blame the Russians. Oh yeah, the Russians did it. We've got absolutely yeah. irrefutable proof that the Russians yeah. were behind this. Oh yeah, there will be enormous pressure at that moment for America to get in. It's going to be yeah. hard for a weak government like Biden to to uh, withstand the pressure to get more directly involved. And as you said earlier, and I agree, yeah. the Americans don't want to get directly involved. This is just too problematic. Once once they kill. Zelensky and blame the Russians, they'll just be hysteria. I mean, Washington will just go crazy and, and demand um, that we, we go directly to war with Russia. Yeah, but, but see, hard. George, 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 see, see, there is your mistake because you, as a thinking individual, realize the secondary consequences of your actions. You realize, well, if, if this happens, then this other thing is going to happen. This other thing we don't want to happen, so we're not going to do this thing because you are a smart, educated, knowledgeable man. These people in Washington don't think that way because they don't have the brain cells, okay? No, they're, Actually, no, they're, they, they they're do have the brain. ideology. They're ideologically possessed. That's yeah. what is the problem here. They, they, and yeah, but, but also what's more important, Peter, is that they're panicking. Yeah. 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 But, but, but still, they can't work outside of their ideological uh, precept. That's the problem here. Yeah. It, it, the reality on the ground is getting so divorced from their propaganda that they are panicking, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and they're freaking out. A good, that's not a good thing. No, 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 because a, a person or a person or institution that acts in a panic makes catastrophically bad decisions. It, it's, it's a truth universally acknowledged. You never make a decision in the heat of the moment. You never make a decision when you're angry or scared. But these people don't understand that. And so what George is saying is, is totally accurate. He was saying his train of thinking is, if they kill Zelensky and blame the Russians, the push for war will be so fierce and powerful because of how Zelensky has been built up that it will be politically impossible for the Biden regime to not send troops to Ukraine. And therefore the United States would be in a direct war with Russia, which it will lose. And that's the train of thought, George, correct me if I- if I'm yeah, No, that's exactly, exactly right. Yeah. yeah, and so you, George, are completely accurate that, that we don't want US versus Russia head to head. We don't want it under any circumstances. But these people are only gonna be thinking, Zelensky is embarrassing us. Zelensky is more trouble than he's worth. We can't tear him down. How do we get rid of him? Light bulb moment, let's just send a missile and blame the Russians. And I'm afraid that that's what they they might possibly do, you know. And I, I think it would be a disaster. It would be a complete and utter disaster, and it would draw the United States into a war. No question. Yeah, I'm just thinking. I remember the at the end of Network when they decide how we how do we still how do we resolve this problem with Howard Peel? Kill, kill Howard Peel. Why do we just kill him? Yeah. Oh, you're just joking, of course, aren't you? Uh, <laughs> okay. And boom, there is they kill him. So it's like yeah. it's the only yeah. way they can solve the Howard Peel problem. Yeah, um, and, and, and so the Zelensky problem, look, it's, a, it's such a neat solution from their point of view because they're thinking we, we try to pull him down is gonna take weeks. We off him in one go and he's a saint and we can do whatever we want. You know, I think that that's what the, the, the rationale and, and I think it's a disaster, but you know, they're, they're not gonna listen to I mean, us. We have said in our conversation here is the Pentagon knows the, the true reading of this, I mean, they, they, there'd be such political pressure for a magnificent Millie there to sign off on it. Well, wow, 
you know, there, there's another resume going down the toilet. I mean, in, in being re held responsible for such a catastrophic decision. Um, but I mean, we see it with, with, with Taiwan. I mean, these people are going for broke. I mean, this is just really extraordinary times to be living in. There's well, also the yeah, obvious is that this, yeah, this, reflect, yeah, this reflects that the United States as a nation is collapsing. Okay, I mean, <laughs> let's not fool ourselves. Uh, the bottom line is that the United States as a nation state is collapsing. Its economy is in free fall. Its currency is, is collapsing because of the money printing that's been going on over the last uh, 27 months or so. You know, the whole thing is falling apart and they don't know how to fix it. They can't fix it. It's beyond salvaging. And so they figure that what they have to do is have a nice little war with somebody, anyone. And this war will potentially, they're thinking that just like World War II, you know, the United States will become the arsenal of democracy and it'll start up business and it'll be like, you know, the ultimate Keynesian move. I mean, you know, what's his name? Uh, um, Paul Krugman is just salivating at the notion of a, a large scale war for the United States. He said that repeatedly kind of, that a war scale, a scale war would solve the American economy. That He's insane. Uh, George, what? you talked about him, Tisdale at the Guardian, I think it is. Oh, there's okay. another Tisdale, moron. Yeah, Simon Tisdale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Re yeah, re yeah. Re ready to go to war. The notice they're all, uh, you know, elderly men who will not be uh, called upon to do any fighting. You know, they're ready. Yeah, it's real to easy go, for them. You know, so, um, uh, but there's also the other aspect. I mean, Lavrov said the other day, essentially, that we're now going for regime change. I mean, that, that, it seems like that is now an, an objective of uh, Moscow. We need to, uh, to have a regime change. We need to liberate the Ukrainian people from the gangsters who are now uh, running it. So that's an interesting aspect of it because I think, you know, Lavrov doesn't just shoot his mouth up. Oh, right? no. That, that's clearly- That man thinks Lavrov. every word six ways to Sunday before he, uh, he, he articulates it. Yeah. yeah, no question. And I think that, uh, yeah, he's right, okay. What'll have to happen, what will happen, is that um, the Russians, once they break through Kramatorsk, they're going to overrun um, all the land uh, of north of the Donbass and they will get to uh, Dnieperpetrovsk and Cherkasy uh, on the Dnieper River. They will probably cross it and keep on going because ultimately, see, there's nothing in the middle of Ukraine. It's all cow country. Now, yeah. all these heavy fortifications, people are saying, oh, it shows that the Russians are losing because, it, you know, they're, they're stuck there, it's a static war. No, it's not. They're patiently grinding through all of those defenses. They're about to break through the last defenses, the last defensive line, which is at Kramatorsk. Once they break through it, there is nothing between Kramatorsk all the way to the far west of Ukraine, to, to uh, Lviv. There's nothing, it's just cows. Cows and, 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 well, not cows really, there aren't that many cows, but uh, you know, wheat fields, there's nothing. Okay. It's a, it's a just, step. It's a step. Yeah. Is what exactly. It is. Okay. And so they're going to roll across that country and uh, that countryside, rather. And they're going to get to Lviv. And, you know, Odessa, Odessa is going to fall. They're not going to attack and assault Odessa. Why would they? All they have to do is surround it and cut it off. They're going to link up with Transnistria. Um, you know, they're, they're, you know, sorry for just using my hand. This is the high tech, <laughs> you know, stuff that I do. But, you know, they're going to go from Kherson here, you know, and uh, and over here, once they break through the Donbass, they're going to link up and go all the way to Transnistria and Odessa down here, if you will. It's going to be cut off. And what happens to a city that gets cut off from all supplies? Well, it's going to fall. <laughs> it's simple as that. And so they don't need to assault it. They just cut it off and, and it'll fall like a ripe apple, right? And insofar as the, the west of of, uh, Ukraine, they're going to keep on uh, uh, driving, um, which was all the way to the border with um, uh, uh, with Poland, and that's all she wrote. Uh, I do not think that the Poles would be foolish enough to actually invade Ukraine because, like I said before, they'll be hit, and and it'll be it'll hurt too hard. Okay, and it, Article Five doesn't come into play if Poland invades Ukraine. Okay. No. Because it'd, it's be, it'd be a violation of Article One. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so you know, it's it's it, it, the polls would be on their own. The Americans are certainly going to support them in all kinds of ways, but that's when you know the the uh, Russians would would pull out their first string gear and really show NATO what it's got. And I don't think NATO really wants to see that. So I, I honestly I don't think that there is going to be a war in between the U.S. and Russia, except in the case that George outlined. 
that they they uh, decide that it's better to have a dead Zelensky than a living one. And that causes a cascade, a, a causal cascade that leads to war as, as was outlined before. Now, that's the only possibility at this point. And, and, you know, fingers crossed, I don't care about Zelensky. I think he's a, a, a war criminal and a scumbag and a thief and a liar and, and just a generalized bastard. And he's got the souls of all those dead um, Ukrainian soldiers, very brave men who died for nothing. And all those men's souls are going to be on his conscience, you know. Uh, but I, I don't care about Zelensky. I certainly don't care if he lives or dies, right? But I certainly don't want him, his fate, his death, potentially, to cause even greater mayhem and death in this region. Gentlemen, I have to step away for like five minutes. If you want to keep going, I'll rejoin you, but I have to, uh, Courier. Sure. Is okay, okay. okay. Lord, okay. you want to keep going? Yeah, we'll click, keep going for a few more minutes and you come back and then we'll just wrap it okay, up. Okay, good, so, okay. okay. All right. Um, no, I think that, uh, I think you know, you're right. Um, I, I mean, I, I can only envisage Poland um, getting involved um, if, um, you, once Ukraine disintegrates, and then if Ukraine disintegrates, then they can just move in and say, "Well, we have to step in uh, to avoid, you know, refugee crisis, yeah. uh, you know, complete instability, and so on." Um, but that, that I think that would be the only uh, condition under which uh, Poland would get in. Only if Ukraine is just disintegrating, and then they have to just uh, say, "Hey, well, we had no choice." I, 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 I think that the Russians are probably they, they. I mean, they obviously these people have backdoor uh, uh, channels uh, that they can communicate with one another. I suspect that the Russians have made it very clear to the Poles, "Don't don't cross that border. You're not going to like it. Even if there's a quote unquote humanitarian crisis, don't cross it." Um, I, I think the Poles got the message, especially with the Kaliningrad situation, because you know how there was like this, this notion that, oh, Kaliningrad is like, you know, and the Lithuanians doing all kinds of idiocy there. Jesus right. Christ. I mean, right. talk about a chihuahua yes. barking at a pit bull. I mean, that was just stupid, you know. Uh, but anyway, you know, I, I think that the Kaliningrad situation kind of like crystallized it for the, for the Poles, rather, that, you know, messing with the Russians is just not worth it. But we'll see. The problem that we have is that we have such incompetent leadership. We have such leaders of such galactic stupidity that you know anything can happen. Anything can happen, and and that's the thing that uh, that frightens me most of all. No, because I, these I, people, yeah. out of ego. No, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sorry. I, yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I think that's the that's the problem. Like as we were saying, um, as likely as not, there won't be. A war between the United States and Russia. We can't rule it out. You know, the, the, the possibility yeah. is not negligible. Um, yeah. But, but the, the problem is, of course, that the supposedly rational voices have been destroyed because ultimately NATO runs everything. And if NATO runs everything, mm -hmm. it means the United States runs it. So what you might have expected in the past, you know, you might have had a Gerhard Schroeder, you might have had a Helmut Schmidt. De Gaulle or whatever, who would Chirac or somebody who could have said, "Look, we this can't go on. You know, we need we need to sit down. You know, hammer out some sort of a a, a peace agreement." There aren't those voices. I mean, ultimately, the United no. States calls all the shots because anything yeah. that Macron comes up with will immediately be rendered null and void by the United States shipping off yet more high Mars to uh, <laughs> Spain, and that's it. Yeah. So what's the point of your you know coming up with any peace plan if we're just going to send you know? Zelensky yet even more money and even more arms. Yeah, keep the you know Vladimir, keep the war going. You know, just you do what you want to do. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's it's crazy, but you know this is the world we live in. There is no way to um, stop this real realistically, and so you know uh, uh, we have to see how it plays out. And like I said, my my. At this time, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not a betting man, but if I were a betting man, I'd say that the odds of NATO getting involved in this are, are maybe one in five, you know, one in one in six, perhaps. Uh, there is, like you said, it's not negligible, but there is a, a, a possibility. Now, the but the war between the U.S. and China, 100 percent, that that's happening, no question, <clears throat> that is happening 100 percent. That war, and I think that the Chinese finally, finally, with this Pelosi visit, they know. They know for a fact. The war is coming. Get ready for it. Batten down the hatches because this war is coming. If not now, maybe next year or the year after that, it's coming. Inevitably, the, the Americans want it. 
They want it. That, that's the insane part. They want a war. I mean, you know, the, the thing about a war, like any physical conflict of any sort, be it a, a street fight, you know, a gang fight, a war, whatever, it's always unpredictable. And the guy who has the, the muscle and the strongest, he doesn't necessarily win. Sometimes the little guy or the guy that you don't think can win, he has something up his sleeve and all of a sudden that's curtains for you. And I think well, that the Americans a, don't yes. seem to understand this. That, well, that's the thing. I mean, it, a, a lot depends on who gets the first blow in. I mean, it's like, you, you know, if you're watching mm -hmm. gangster movies, you know, yeah. somebody, you know, he, he, he turns around as if he, he doesn't want to fight. You know, he just hits you on the head, it break, breaks your nose and that's it. You're on the ground. And then the little guy can actually prevail simply because he got the first blow in. Um, and and yeah. that's always, that's always, now, of course, that doesn't mean that you will prevail in the end. I mean, you know, that, that was a problem with Germany. Germany knows we, we have to get our first blow in. We don't have the resources for a long war. And yeah, Germany is very good at getting early victories, um, but it's not so good at uh, enduring long war when it's, lim you know, with its limited resources come into play, its geographic vulnerabilities come into play. But, but it, definitely, if you get yeah. the first blow in, you know, that, that helps an enormous amount. Yeah, well, look, I, I've speculated, um, and, and a lot of people thought I was just crazy. And, and I, I, I will admit that the idea I have is crazy. It's really crazy. But I speculated that if, if I were the Chinese, I would hit them now because you catch them with their pants down. They're not ready for it. The Americans are not ready for it. And I think that if the Americans provoke them hard enough, they might do it. Uh, because one has to understand two things about uh, what I've noticed about Chinese as a people is that on the one hand, they are extraordinarily patient. They, they will take their sweet time with their goals and their plans, and they will try to minimize conflict. But on the other hand, when they feel that they have been disrespected, dishonored, when, when, they, when you really rile their hackles, right? They get hysterical and they lash out fiercely. And th this seems to be uh, the, the, the way that the national psyche is, because I am a believer that different peoples they tend to have different psyches. I've lived enough in enough different places to recognize this. You know, uh, people in Italy are vastly different from Dutchmen. There is a different mentality, a different approach, and it's a national thing. And the weird thing is that a lot of times an immigrant will live long enough in one country or another, and he will absorb and adopt as his own that mentality. And the Chinese, from what I have experienced on a personal level, and so far as doing business with Chinese, and of seeing you know, them interacting in a business environment and a political environment, they are patient until they lash out. But that, it but could that's be the that problem. they lash they out. They don't necessarily have the good judgment. This is something that Peter and I discussed yes. the other day, which was yeah. that, um, uh, you know, unlike the Russians, the Chinese do a lot of blustering. And there's a problem about blustering yes. because if you bluster and then you don't really follow through on your threats, then people think you're an idiot. Like now. Yeah, exactly. They kind of they, they yeah. take it as a joke. The Russians don't do that. Russians do not bluster. They are very, no. very patient. You know, they take insults and they, they just wait till the moment to strike. You know, they're not going to go out on a limb yeah. and start a fight that they don't think they can win. Um, and and I think phrase, that's where they... <laughs> yeah, go. The phrase that George and I always use, the Russians don't bluff. They ask. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's also another thing about the Russians. I've said this many times before, and so forgive me if I might be repeating myself, but see, the different peoples are good at different things. The Chinese are great merchants. Uh, the Italians, uh, you know, great at food, and the French, great at fashion. The Russians, they're good at war. It's as simple as that. It's not complicated. They, they know how to fight a war. They, uh, and I suspect in, in a perverse way, and I mean no disrespect to the Russian people, but I think that in a weird way in their core, they kind of like it because it crystallizes everything. There's no more ambiguity. When you're at war, you're at war. And but I think they, that, that it appeals to the um, very uh, uh, you know, basic, straightforward approach of the Russians of like, let's go and just kick the shit out of these people. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say they, I wouldn't say they I, I mean, no disrespect, by the way, no, no, no disrespect no, no. at all. I, I think there's a nuanced way here. Um, I, I don't think they, 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 they like war, but they, understand existential threats yes. 
and yes. it's something they've had a long history with. It's a people that it's a to be or not to be situation. Yep. Look, I've been living here for a quarter century. Yeah, you're, you're, you're right. The, the, Russian, the Russians, you know, um, they, the, the law applies to you, but not to me. That's a, it's a mentality that you see a lot, okay? But then at a certain point, then at a certain point there is, it, it, everything gels, everything coalesces. It's like, this is one of those moments. Right. And, and, it, and it's, it's very badly understood in the West in, intentionally, but the second world war is here with me in this country every single day, yep. every heart beat. Yeah. And that's something the West doesn't understand. What Russia is in a to be or not to be moment. That's when people get mobilized. That's when um, all the squabbling comes to an end yep. and they have a goal. Yep. I'm gonna go right with you right now. They have a goal, this is what we have to do. We have to do it and we don't mess around. And I'll tell you, in the first two months of the conflict, the grumblings were, when are the gloves coming off? People are getting impatient. It's yep. time to finish this. It's get this yep. over with because we will win, we yeah. will win. There's no doubt in anyone's mind, we yeah. will win. Yeah, yeah. You know, and what's interesting about it is that uh, you, you think of Tolstoy, he wrote uh, War and Peace, um, I want to say in 1865, 1867, uh, around there, in the late 60s of the 19th century, of course. Um, and I do believe that uh, at the time that he wrote it, it was a huge bestseller in Russia, obviously. But see, people were still thinking about the Napoleonic Wars. You know, and they had been 50 odd years, almost 60 years before, but it was still present. It was still the thing, you know, because the, the Russians, like you say, they know about existential wars. They know about being invaded and potentially being annihilated as a people. And that kind of mentality, yeah, when, when you're done, you're done. And, and it, I, I think it's, it's you know, I, I don't it, it, understand it, it. You know, you know I don't it, understand it, it, why they're so foolish. In the West, the West, I mean, the West. In the West, they don't understand is in, when the Napoleonic Wars came to an end. The Tsar was in Paris. When the Second World War was over, Stalin was in Berlin. That's the way they see endings here. And and George and I have made it very clear. They're, they're not going to take a half measure. Why? Do it five years from now? Do it ten no. years from now? Do it now. Get it over uh, with now. Uh, that, that's yeah. right, and that's that's why if you look through the um, the wartime diplomacy of uh, Stalin, you can see Stalin was thinking in terms of a, a peace for a couple of generations. In other words, he's thinking about you know we we want to eliminate all threats to the Soviet Union for at least fifty years, which is kind of what they got um, until Gorbachev yeah, pretty Russia much it all away. Uh, in other words, we're not going back to the situation we had before World War II, when we were continually worrying about um, Europe ganging up on us and invading us. You know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be worrying about that for another 50 years, and, you know, that, and that's what they had. So I think that's what they're thinking now. We're not gonna go back to where we were with, you know, with, with the Minsk agreements and relying on Germany and France and the United States to implement. It's like all, this, all these ridiculous articles we've talked about so many times on, Oh, no, 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 no articles. Oh, no Minsk. more articles. Let's have Minsk three and uh, autonomy. <laughs> no, autonomy not... in the Donbass. You know, we'll settle for that. You know, no, no. No. That, that, I know, George. George, it, you know, it, it's you know, you should work for a responsible statecraft and and support Minsk three, and you'll probably be able to hire <laughs> on the money. Be able That's to right. say such garbage. Yeah. Okay. No, but uh, let me ask you something, Peter. Um, you're in Moscow right now, correct? What is the uh, what do Russians generally think uh, when they think of victory in this situation? How do how do they envision it? What 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 is uh, you know? Forget about what Lavrov and uh, Maria Zagarova and and Putin himself might be saying. You know, I mean, again, no disrespect to either any of those three uh, people, but what do how do Russians view victory? What would make them happy? What would they say? Yes, we won. You know what bothers people most? Mm -hmm. It's the human dimension because so many families have relatives that are in Ukraine. And yeah. The, 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 this is the greatest tragedy for people here is how are we gonna mend this fence that has been torn down? Now, 
I'm far more partisan, okay, and much more politically driven mm -hmm. uh, when I because I talk, I think about this stuff, but I talk about this stuff all the time. Right. But other people don't. They have their day to day lives. But you know, uh, how are they going to mend this chasm that well, that has been created with Ukraine? Because um, you know, people can criticize me all they want, but for Russians, Ukraine is an extension of the Russian space. I mean, they are a separate people. They have a separate state. There, there's no denying that. But as much as you know, and I, the Western media has never been able to do uh, service to Gruski Mir because the Ukrainians will say, we don't want to be part of Gruski Mir, but nobody explains what that means in Western media. Mm -hmm. But here it's very meaningful. And it's not, and it, 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 there's no malice involved. It's not like forcing anybody to do anything. So, you know, they, victory is, is that when we stop fighting each other and want to fight each other, mm -hmm. it could be the vast majority of people are not political here. People here want results from the government. If, if they don't get results, they don't give it hoot about the government, okay? Right. If, they, if they generate results, that's okay, yeah, okay? Right. All the other trimmings and all this garbage that you hear in the West, they don't care about. They want results. They want streets that are clean. They want schools to teach their kids. They want prosperity. Mm -hmm. they, they want dignity, okay? Yeah. And, that, and that's it. That's the long and the short of it. Victory is to stop the killing of, of uh, brotherly um, nations because yeah. they do feel that way about Ukraine. Yeah. Not about the Nazis, not about Zelensky, yeah. not about the oligarchs, but the poor suffering of people in Ukraine. People are, you know, through couriers are sending money, you know, you know, you know, it's almost like an underground railroad, you know, where people are going and they're giving them cash. They say, get this to my babushka, get this to my aunt, you know, and, and people are working furiously to do that because of the whole banking system has collapsed. That's what they want. And, and that's what, you know, again, this existential, they understand what people are going through in Ukraine because that's what the West does to us. Right. Yeah. So it's, it, I, that's it's completely valid. Uh, but but I, I have to insist on the point. What do you think the Russians would view like taking Kiev, taking all of Ukraine, or I, or I don't think you know. Obviously, I talk to my like my good friend Dmitry Babich and the, the Russians. And they will give me a very clear answer. But for mm -hmm. the for the for average people, they it's just want, peace. They just want peace. That's mm -hmm. what they want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It doesn't mean, you know, regime type. Well, no, I mean, if you, if you dig a little deeper, yeah, get rid of those Nazis. I had a friend of mine, a young lady, she said, if all those Azov people and, you know, and they're found guilty, she said, I would love to collectively throw the switch on all of them. <laughs> yeah. This is like a 22 year old, okay? Yeah. I, I would not, uh, I, I don't really disagree with her sentiment because I understand completely. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, um, yeah, no, so, so it, it's good to know that that the mentality is not we are conquering, it's rather we are, yeah, no, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, anyway, like, but Gonzalo, in the West, they don't understand that. Gonzalo, like, how do you conquer your front? How do you conquer your front yard? Yeah, okay? <laughs> good, good point. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Anyway, look, this is a really great discussion. Thank you so much, Gonzalo, for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Yet another very stimulating discussion. I think, you know, we all learned and a lot and enjoyed very much. I'm sure gagglers will enjoy it a great deal. So I hope you'll be able to join us again very shortly. Um, and you know, I'd be delighted. Uh, give, give us an update on um, what's going on. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and right. remember, Gentlemen. if you like the gaggle, please like, share and subscribe. See you soon. Bye. <laughs>